Thank you. Good morning. So I'm going to be talking today about uh, incorporating C++ into Mars flight software and a few other tangential things, but most, mostly that. So take yourself back. We're going to go back to the year 2000. And imagine working on a little embedded systems project, just implementing the latest in rover navigational autonomy and wanting to do it on Mars. So that, that's the framework where we were starting from for the Mars Exploration Rovers. And uh, here you can see the, the three rovers that NASA has sent in the last couple decades. We started with uh, Sojourner, the small one down at the bottom there, about the size of a microwave oven. And uh, then on, moved on to the Mars Exploration Rovers, Spirit and Opportunity. And now the one on the right, Curiosity, is exploring Mars and has been there for um, just over two years. So this is the, the framework for what we're going to talk about today. <laughs> and uh, as John mentioned, we have a small problem with our embedded system, which is that because of the distance between Earth and Mars, we really can't talk to the rover in real time. And the usual reason you hear from people about why that can't be is because of the delay in the time it takes for radio waves to travel between, between the, the rover and the receiving antenna. Uh, depending on where the planets are, can take anywhere from 4 to 22 minutes just to send a signal one way. So if you can imagine trying to joystick something and having a really bad lag time, it's worse than any game lag experience you might have had so far. Um, <clears throat> and it turns out that's not the only constraint either. Uh, even if we had like a dedicated set of antennas that were only on this mission, uh, you'd have that, that problem. You can only talk a few times a day. And once it turns out, we, we have to share the antennas with dozens of other missions. So um, really, there's also a logistical constraint of when do you get time on the big antennas to talk to the other planet. And so the real way to think of this, this problem is that you only get to talk to the vehicle, send commands like once a day. So humans basically spend all day planning, planning, planning what to do, send up the commands, and then we wait for the results to come back down later. And we, we do have several um, occasions to get new data down. We get two or three passes of data coming back every day. And what kind of things would we want to do? Um, the thing I, I care about most is being one of the rover drivers. I, l I love driving. Um, so one of, the th one of the plans we do is to decide where to go. And so it's a, it's a really um, joint effort between the science team picking the overall destination and the uh, operations team that gets to implement every day's activities. So the science team will say, we want to go to these, these mountains eight kilometers over there. And we're going to go step by step, and we'll work out what the best way to go is. And what you're seeing here is an animation that was created. Let me just play it again. Um, this is an animation created by our commanding software. We actually write commands, and we simulate the commands on the data we've gotten from a previous day. So you're seeing a, the playback of what the plan was for one day of rover driving. The plan was to drive in these two short legs, a straight line to the middle and another straight line for the rest. And you're also seeing that in the second leg there, it's, it's twisting the camera around and looking place to place. For the second part of the drive, we ask the rover, don't trust us where to go. You pick the right direction. We ask the rover to pick where to steer. And so only for the second half, it was actually looking at the terrain. At least that was the plan. You'll see what happened uh, later on in the talk. <clears throat> so the way the rovers work is they carry out their activities and then upload data to spacecraft orbiting Mars uh, to, be, to be relay stations. Uh, in order to communicate to Earth, the, the bigger the antenna you have, the more power you have, the better, more, more bandwidth you get. So we typically send back all the high volume stuff by routing it through local, uh, local satellites like the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, Mars Odyssey, sometimes Mars Express. So it's nice to have relay stations at, at Mars. So how do you build? one of these embedded systems projects. Well, it takes a lot of people. There were literally thousands of people involved with the rovers at, at JPL over the last, last couple of decades. But basically, you start with a robust, fault-tolerant hard, hardware setup and overall software design. And <clears throat> to, get, to get the rover to do really interesting things, I mean, it's interesting enough to go to another planet, but then to ask it to figure out where to drive safely, figure out how to do things on its own, uh, that's where you want to throw in as much more autonomous capability as you can get, and a uh, little foreshadowing of how we 
we're able to do that on these missions. Uh, and then once you've got a system, you test, test as you fly. Uh, that's the mantra at JPL. You don't want to just test components. You obviously do some of that, but you also have to test at a system level over and over and over again just to eke out any possible concerns that might come up later. And just test, 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 test. So for the rover missions, we had a pretty constrained environment. You know, these days you've got you know, gigahertz of processing power and gigabytes or terabytes of, of uh, RAM and disk, and we didn't have that. <clears throat> so remember this, uh, the MER rovers were designed starting in the year 2000. And so back then we had this embedded system that had to use space qualified, radiation hardened components, and it all had to work together, <clears throat> had to survive the launch, had to survive the trip to Mars, had to survive the landing, as well as operating on a planet where the temperature changes 100 degrees every night. So you got all this thermal cycling. It's worse than leaving your, you know, leaving your phone in the car in Southern California. It's a <clears throat> even bigger temperature swing. Um, so the kind of system that we uh, that, that we had to work with was this um, these rad hardened PowerPC derivative boards, and you can see the clock speeds are really paltry by by modern standards, but. Considering what we had before, we were doing pretty well. Uh, I didn't put in this table, but the Sojourner rover, that had a, a CPU of about 0.1 megahertz. So we actually quite an improvement over the, the previous generation. Um, we, had, we had a reasonable amount of RAM to work with, but um, all of our operating software, everything, the operating system, plus all the code that we developed for the application, all the safety systems, all the communications, uh, all had to fit within 32 megabytes of RAM. And in fact, ended up fitting into 10 megabytes of RAM. We used the rest of the RAM for just uh, uh, normal operations. And you can see that the, the two missions from 2000 MER and from 2012 MSL, Mars Science Lab, the Curiosity rover, uh, they're pretty comparable, although we did get more, more RAM to play with. We had an extra um, 512 megabytes on Curiosity, and that, that gave us more flexibility in, in autonomy, more, more um, extra room for, for doing development for the autonomous software, and also for grabbing extra images, storing them. Um, and the other interesting part of this constraint from a programming standpoint is that we're using the, the VxWorks operating system, and in the configuration we had, uh, VxWorks runs multiple tasks, so separate, you know, separate behaviors running different tasks, but they're not, not like Unix processes, they're not independent. It's all using one big chunk of shared memory. So you really have to be careful, you don't want to be stomping on each other's memory as you're, as you're working. Um, so you have to take that into account, so it's one big playground and you have to be really careful with how you, how you code your software not to, uh, not to interact with the other modules, except through the defined mechanism. <coughs> And so because we were doing C, the missions were mostly written in C, but I did get a special waiver on MER, and I'll talk about that um, coming up here, to use C++. And we had a commercial compiler on MER, and on MSL we opted to go with the open source uh, GCC compiler. So when you look at the flight software for controlling these rovers, um, it was developed by having separate developers maintain each separate module functionality. We had over 100 modules. And um, the way that they communicate was by message passing. We used queues between these tasks to, to queue up a request, and we were just time slicing between the different tasks going back and forth. Uh, and occasionally when you're passing big pieces of information like images around, then you have to use the shared memory, but we really kept that kind of stuff to a minimum to keep, keep it safe and robust for real-time operations. And you'll see throughout the talk, I, I list some pointers down at the bottom in a little darker font. Um, if you're interested to hear more about any certain topic, you can search for that online and I'm sure you can, you can track, track that stuff down. I'm also happy to take questions. If anyone has any questions uh, you know, during the talk, I'm happy to try to respond to it. Um, I apologize if I can't see right away. The lights are a little, little bright, so, uh, but feel free to, to ask questions. So out of the over 100 modules that we have, here's a, here's a graph showing some of the, the ones related to mobility. Um, so as a developer, each one of these modules had a single developer behind it 
Um, and so like the mobility manager is the module that receives, receives commands. When you want to command the spacecraft in the flight software, here's how it, here's how it comes in. Command comes in, gets written to flash, and when, it's, when time is ready to execute it, it calls the command flight software that parses it, realizes it's a mobility command, and fires off the mobility module, communicates with that. Mobility module checks and says, hey, are we in a state that we're allowed to drive? Or did someone earlier say, no driving right now? And if it's OK to drive, then, then the mobility module checks and makes sure that all the resources it needs are available. Like, do I have access to the wheels? Do I have access to the motor controllers? Can I get the images I need for this, for this command? So it's doing all that checking first before it ever tries to talk to the motors or do any, any of the actual work underneath. And once it understands what, what the issue is, so let's say we want to ask it to drive and take a picture and figure out where it's going. Then it would talk to the image processing module to grab the picture and send it back. Then it routes it to this, this little box here, which is the surface navigation module. Um, that's the one that I, I got to work on. And this one does all the high level processing of the terrain. And again, you'll see all that in, in a minute. But um, comes back here. And then once we know what we want to do, then we send a command. Let's drive. Let's go forward change heading a few degrees, and command the motors to make it happen. And as we're driving, we're checking with the IMU along the way. Everyone now has IMUs probably in your pocket, in your cell phone. You have accelerometers and gyros, and we have that on the Mars rover too. And that's what we use while we're moving to keep track of our current attitude, which way are we pointed, uh, what's our roll, our pitch, and our yaw, our heading. So as I said, we have more than 100 of these separate modules. But this one right here, um, even though it's only less than 1% in terms of number, it actually generated almost 20% of the code size in MER and 10% of uh, the Curiosity rover. So it's, it's big, it's complicated, it has a lot of components, it has to do a lot of work. And how did we choose to manage it? So we decided that we would use C++. Um, what part of the Mars rover is using C++? Uh, most of the onboard autonomous driving capability is written in C++. So all the image classes and the, the high-level code for making images map into a 3D shape of the world, um, all these different technologies I've listed here are part of the rover's uh, commandable system, and it's all written in C++. Uh, obviously, we, we also work with the rest of the system in C, so there's, there's some um, interfacing there, but, but the bulk of it is C++. So w I'll get into several of these in the next few minutes. But just to run down it, um, dense stereo vision, we take pairs of images and con convert those images into clouds of points. And each point has an XYZ coordinate. So you know where you are, you're just floating in space. And given those point clouds, what do you do with it? Is it safe to drive there, or do we have to turn around from something? So doing the assessment of the terrain is also C++. We have high-level planning for figuring out where to drive. Once we know where it's safe to be, how do you drive around it, drive through it? Uh, do we just drive on one day, or can we pick it up the next day without a human in the loop? Just let, let the rover take over and wake up and just start driving. We have another capability that lets it measure. Uh, visual odometry is sort of a replacement for wheel odometry. On your car, you have an odometer, and it works pretty well because you've got rubber tires on an asphalt surface. You're not slipping. It measures it pretty well. But when you're driving over rocks, you got metal on rocks, you're slipping a lot, especially when you're in sand. And the only sensor we have on board for actually knowing where we are, how much we might have slipped, is our cameras. We use the cameras to take before and after pictures, and, and we can measure the difference there. And that's all done with the, the C++ um, uh, robotic autonomy software. So we also use that same measurement technique to figure out, are we slipping, or did, are we making enough progress? And as we're commanding every drive, uh, before a drive is planned, humans will tell it, you know what, I want you to do all this driving, but keep in this box. If you find yourself outside of this box, that's not a good thing. That We didn't intend for that to happen, so just stop right now. Uh, and that kind of processing is also done in C++. So how do we end up picking C++? Um, well, throughout the 1990s, a lot of research tasks at JPL were sponsored and funded by NASA to develop technologies for rovers. And the researchers doing that work just decided that at that time the, the right tool for the job was C++. Uh, we, we all wanted to keep it very flight-like, ready to be adopted by, by an actual mission. 
So a lot of these rovers were actually implemented using the same kind of operating system, the same real-time operating system VxWorks. And for that, you, can, you could develop in whatever language that the OS supported, and everybody preferred to use C++ because it let us you know, do separate development. We had the abstraction of classes would let us um, independently work on the different modules, and it all came together really, you know, really effectively. We just, we got our work done better and faster and more robustly using the abstraction capabilities that C++ gave us. So we all chose to, to go that way. And having done that, all these capabilities then get demoed on these real rovers. These are pictures of some of the, just a few of the rovers that JPL worked on um, back then. And on all of these, we were running real, real-time OS, VxWorks, and we're demonstrating all kinds of capabilities for um, autonomous operation. And um, they eventually, when, when the mission decided that they wanted to do something more complex, we were able to, to leverage that. Uh, but the key point here is that we had already developed it, we'd already field tested it, and we had years of experience with this code base in C++. So by the year 2000, it, as far as I know, I, I, I didn't get to talk to everybody at NASA, but uh, I talked to several people, and we really hadn't flown C++, at least not in the Mars program, um, at all uh, as of the year 2000. And that's when the MER development started. <clears throat> But, and the reason for that, even though C++ had been around for over a decade, um, the reason for that was that missions are always really reluctant to embrace change. They don't want change for change's sake. And in order to minimize risk, they want to pick a solution that is based on flight heritage. So, you know, there's pre presumed to be less risk to use the same kind of approach that was used already successfully on the prior mission. So it's really hard to throw new things into into the mix with that paradigm. But that was, that was the reasoning that went into it for several, you know, for many missions before that. Um, but in this case, we weighed the risk that we always have to consider of using a new, dev new development environment, a new language like C++. We weighed that against the risk of, of porting all that code, changing it from C++ to C, and then having to retest everything and, and re revalidate everything. You know, we had this existing code base that was already proven. It had been through the research test program and demo program. And so happily, I was able to convince the mission that they should take it and go with the C++. And uh, I think it was still the right solution because number one, it did save us time in getting the code working. And number two, it helped us in develop the flight software because you, you, you test more, you make more changes. And having that framework really benefited us in letting us get changes made more quickly, effectively, and safely. So what exactly does the C++ part of the Mars Rover code do? Uh, I've given you some words, but let me give you a little more detail. Um, most of it is based around the automatic interpretation of images, either for safe driving, looking to see where you're about to drive and avoiding any rocks, slopes, or ditches or rough areas, um, or measuring your position, or tracking something that it sees, tracking it as you drive by. Um, but it's all about the, the cameras and the autonomous image processing that goes into it. So what are the resources we have? I showed you the computing resources before. Uh, here's a view of some of the, the capabilities and some of the uh, sensors that we have for, for doing the work that we do on board. The Mars rovers, I'm showing you Curiosity, the current, the newest Mars rover, uh, but it's a similar kind of um, layout for, for MER as well. And so we have 17 cameras, and several of those are used mostly for engineering purposes. Um, we have cameras on the mast, we have cameras on the body on the front here, there's also pairs of cameras on the back and the corners, uh, there's a camera on the arm. Several of the science instruments have cameras too, uh, they're not in stereo pairs. They're not going to be. Um, they're not going to be able to give us 3D data without either stereo or, or focus change. But uh, there, there's a lot of cameras on the vehicle, and for the autonomous stuff, we generally use the stereo pairs. So down on the body are uh, pairs of cameras with a very wide field of view. Here's a sample picture over here. You can see that the camera's right in the middle, and it can see both wheels. It's got a 120 degree field of view horizontal vertical, it's actually 180 diagonal using a fisheye lens. And what we do is we uh, collect images that we can't point these cameras, they're fixed rigidly to the body. 
But we either use the pair that's this camera with this one or this one with this one. Um, and which pair we use is actually fixed to the CPU. It, for robustness, for reliability, we have two different um, uh, CPUs on board. And we actually can switch between them. We, we did switch between them uh, back on Sol 200 about a year and a half ago um, when we had a, a, a fault in the flash memory on the, on the main computer. We ended up switching to the backup computer. And one side effect is a, of that is that we ended up switching cameras too. So instead of using the you know, one pair over here, we use the other pair. So there are also cameras on the mast. And so the mast is at about human eye level height, uh, a little bit higher than that. It's almost two meters up. But uh, the reason to have the cameras up there is when you see pictures from these cameras, it looks like what you would see if you were standing on the surface of Mars. Uh, the baseline's a little bit wider than in your head. Most people have about a seven centimeter baseline, and this one is about a 46 centimeter baseline. Uh, we, that helps us see farther away. But we use these images both for planning drives a long way out and also for looking at the nearby terrain because it's got very high resolution view of the, the terrain nearby. And so using those cameras, some of the capabilities we have um, are for driving. And uh, I'll tell you a little bit, but a little bit about the driving. <clears throat> With the Mars rovers, we can choose to drive it in several different ways. One way is what we call directed driving. And in that, humans just decide, I want you to go this way over here. So think about like a very low level programmable toy robot where you could say, you know, move, move forward two, two meters, turn 90 degrees, move forward two meters, turn in place. Um, that's exactly how we, we drive it when it's in this directed driving mode. So what we do is we will look at the terrain in 3D, figure out where it's safe to drive, and just send it commands and have it do those commands. We only drive it that way nearby where we started because as you drive, you accumulate a little error in your position. There's a little uncertainty with where it ends up. So we, we don't want to go too far with that, but um, we're, we're allowed to drive it uh, directly for some distance. And the reason we choose to do that is that's the fastest mode. Uh, every time we take a picture, it takes a few seconds to grab the picture, to transfer it to RAM, and then more, more time to process the images. Uh, so it's always going to be faster for these rovers to, uh, to be uh, driven directly by human command. But uh, we also have the onboard autonomous capabilities, like the looking at the terrain for where the hazards are. And what you're seeing here is an animation of the rover building up a map of what the world looks like around it. So the, um, the yellow cells are sort of the terrain that's, it's OK. Green is perfectly safe. Yellow is not, not too bad, but getting a little sketchy. And red would be don't go there. Uh, so you can see it's driving through an area that's pretty clear. It's, it's just middle of the road. It has some ver terrain variation, but not, not enough to be a hazard. And then the other one was this visual odometry for measuring um, where you are and whether you're slipping. And <clears throat> some, visual odometry is something that we added to the Mars Exploration Rovers. And it turned out to be really beneficial. It allowed us to drive more safely and know when we got stuck and know our position. Uh, and it's now standard both on MER and, and on MSL. One thing we added to MSL is the ability for the rover to decide when it needs to be running the autonomy. So there's autonomy choosing when to turn on the autonomy. Um, and it's basically whenever it is noticing that something is a little bit out of, out of range that we set, if, if the wheels are spinning but drawing more current than we expect, that would be a trigger that would say, hey, I want to stop and look and measure whether I'm make, still making progress or getting buried. Uh, or also if the uh, the rate at which it's turning isn't as fast as we think or as, as we expect. What happened to Opportunity Rover back in 2005 was it was driving on this ostensibly flat terrain through these dunes, and it got stuck in a dune. We ended up calling Purgatory because it took us two months to get out of there. Um, and one, some of the lessons learned there were things like, well, could we have predicted that we were getting stuck? Because what happened was we, we commanded it to drive 90 meters, almost a football field, and halfway through, it got stuck in this, in this dune and it didn't make any more progress. So it's spinning its wheels for 50 meters worth of driving, just slowly sinking in the sand. And so what we noticed looking back at the data was, well, the average currents are kind of increasing as that happens. So maybe we could you know, make a filter to check for that. 
And also it tried to turn in place and wasn't able to turn fast enough. And that's actually what stopped it from driving more, was it noticed that it took six minutes to turn around and it shouldn't take that long. So all these things now are built into the, the next rover and it uses those as clues to say, hey, I'm gonna measure what my progress is now because I don't want to get too embedded. We don't want to spend another uh, two months getting out. Two weeks of that was getting out of being embedded in meetings discussing what to do. Um, So this is just a couple of the images that show how the visual odometry works. Uh, the way that it measures where its position is, is it just looks at whatever happens to be around in the terrain. It just takes a, looks out the window and says, what's here? And then it compares what it sees now to what it saw before it moved a small bit, like about a meter. And what you can see, I hope you can see in the, the monitors, the green lines are showing features that the rover detected on board by itself. And it shows the motion of those features from where it started to where it ended up. So you have like before and after pictures here. And it's actually looking at stereo pairs. I'm just showing one of the images. But uh, you can see when it's moving, it can find these features like corners of rocks, boundaries between rock and, and sand, or just different texture on the rocks. And it tracks them all by itself and takes the collected knowledge of how that was tracked to do a nonlinear estimation of what the, the change of its attitude was. So at this point, I want to give you a little video to, to help explain what's going on when the rover is driving itself, uh, avoiding obstacles in the terrain. Um, so this will help explain more about what's going on for the, the onboard autonomy, again, mostly written in C++, uh, for driving through natural terrain. So the sound folks, we're going to turn on the audio at this point. OK, so I'll, I'll let the clip do the talking, but I'm happy to answer questions about it after it's done. Today's lesson is Autonomous Waypoint Navigation in Natural Terrain. This is your designated goal location. First, watch this video to learn how it's done. A robot exploring natural terrain needs to continually find and avoid navigational hazards such as large rocks and steep slopes. Our system models the terrain using stereo vision, determines and stores how safe the rover would be at each location in the model, then estimates the traversability of several possible driving paths. The rover chooses the safest path that moves it closer to its goal and drives a short distance along that path. This process of taking pictures, predicting rover safety, and driving continues until the goal is reached. The first step of the navigation cycle is to take pictures. A pair of cameras at the front of the rover capture simultaneous left and right images of the terrain. Features in the image pair are correlated and triangulated to determine the distance to the feature from the cameras. Range data must satisfy a number of tests before being accepted as correct. Confusing or misleading features, like parts of the vehicle and areas of the image seen from only one camera, are automatically removed from consideration. The resulting points are accumulated into a three-dimensional geometric model of the terrain. This 3D model is evaluated for safety across a grid at rover wheel resolution. For each grid cell, Points within a rover-sized patch are fitted to a plane 
and rated for traversability. Each patch is checked for steps, excessive tilt, and roughness. Obstacles are expanded by the radius of the rover so that the rover center will stay far enough away from the obstacle to keep the entire vehicle out of danger. Each patch is accumulated into a gridded traversability map that drapes across the terrain near the rover, including areas not currently visible from the cameras. A small number of paths are superimposed onto the map and evaluated both for safety and also closeness to the navigation goal location. The rover chooses the safest path that gets it closer to its goal and drives a short distance along that path. After each step, the navigation process repeats until the goal is reached, no safe path is available, or the rover is commanded to stop. Now it's your turn to try. Oh dear, maybe we should watch that video one more time. Okay, so now you're all experts. <clears throat> so that, that's how the, uh, the onboard autonomy works when it's driving around obstacles. Um, we are using basically the same software, the same C++ code that was developed on MER was the basis for MSL software too. MSL is a little bit different. The cameras are placed a little differently, so we're actually using four sets of stereo wedges, not just, not just one. But the overall processing is the same, same kind of approach on both rovers. And so what ends up happening is that when we ask it to drive by itself, the rover drives in a series of steps, stopping every like half a meter to a meter and a half. Uh, taking the four sets of images on Curiosity, finding any place that might be hazards, and then choosing a safe way to drive around it. And one thing that, that changed since, since that video was made, that animation, is that we've also added a high-level global planner on that, which I'll show you in a little bit. So I don't know if you remember, way back at the beginning, I showed a clip of what the plan was for a day to, of driving on Mars. It was going to drive in two straight lines. Uh, this is what actually happened when we sent those commands up to the rover. You can see that in this part, it actually did drive that straight part of it. But the, the second half, the part where we asked it to look where it was going, um, it decided that it didn't want to go straight ahead. I'll play it again. You can see it starting here. You see the camera head turning as it, as it goes. What it's noticing is that these rocks in front of it are different elevation and have a slightly worse evaluation than the path to the side here. And so in its estimation, it said, well, I could go this way, but you know what? It's even better to go on the other side here, so I'm just going to choose that. So the plan that we had sent was drive straight and drive a little bit off to the side here, and, but the rover said, thanks, I'll, I'll make my own choices. Uh, and so that's, that was the first, first day that we had Curiosity demonstrating that software running on Mars. We've used it a lot since then. I'll show you uh, some stats on that later. And just to give you an idea, this is the terrain. Actually, let me, I can jump ahead to this one. Um, this is the map that it produced on board. So, you know, the code is running, and we grab images, and then the C gets it, converts the, the pictures to 3D points, colors the, the points by estimating what the shape is at each, at each position of what, what the rover would be if, if, it, if it were there, would it be safe or not, and then chooses the path to go through here. And what you're seeing is this, this is the map that it creates. And then over here, this is showing the map. And also, it's hard to tell, but there are some arrows in here. The sort of gray points in here are actually arrows telling it which way to go. Uh, if you do any gaming, you might have seen you know, your, your enemies and your games would find the your search strategy of how, how compute, com, uh, you know, the computer enemy chooses how to drive itself. 
And those kinds of algorithms usually use what's called the A-star algorithm. It's like an optimal search strategy. Uh, some folks at Carnegie Mellon University developed uh, and a way of using A star, it's an optimal search, but they made it much more efficient for rovers because with a rover, your world isn't changing that often. You're not moving through it that quickly. You're getting more information just in a local patch. And so they, they came up with a, a faster version of A star called dynamic A star or D star. And so we're using that algorithm to uh, help the rover drive itself. So some other, uh, some other capabilities that we have um, on board, in addition to that one that I, that I mentioned, that that's called D-Star, or the particular version of it is Field D-Star. We also have the ability to, um, and, and here's, here's a view of that. You, you saw it working on Mars. This is it working in the test bed. And you can see here, we had an indoor, indoor sandbox, and we boxed it in. And we wanted to see what would happen if it were to get boxed in on Mars. So what happens is it starts and it takes pictures and builds up its knowledge of the terrain. And we sent it to this goal, which is actually unreachable. It's in the next room behind a wall. But we wanted the rover to figure that out for itself. And what you're seeing is how it builds up its map of the world and realizes where it's going. The, the blue line here shows its current best path to the goal. So as it realizes there's a wall in between it and the goal, it changes its mind and picks a new, new path. Another thing we added, uh, after we'd already landed on Mars, we made updates to the flight software. We had a whole technology development effort at JPL, and we added another ability to automatically place the arm on a target. And it doesn't sound like much, you know, just basically drive and put the arm out, but in order to meet all the mission criteria for safety, and we didn't want to break the arm, we didn't want to break the rover, uh, we had to upgrade the software to do a high resolution stereo processing on board, much higher than we, than we, excuse me, than we needed to do for the autonomous driving, because we had to see the terrain in much more detail. But we were able to build up a higher resolution view of the terrain, model it with an knock tree, and automatically find places where it would be safe to position the arm and actually deploy the arm, generate trajectories to get the arm out and down on the, on the terrain. So that was another technology that we demonstrated on the Mars Exploration Rover. And here's another one, which is visual target tracking. Uh, also in C++, and it, I'm sorry, it's not, not a great, it's not animated, but basically we looked at a rock from some distance away and then we drove past it so that it passed us by on the right. And as we're driving, we took pictures of it to make sure we kept it in view. And what we're doing is we're just running a correlator between the two images and tracking the feature as we go. And so we have this capability that if we do a long range drive, we can keep watching something along the way. And there's several reasons you might want to do this. Um, when you specify where a target is, if you're far away, there might be some error in where you think it is. You, you measure it in, in 3D, but there's some error because when you're triangulating a long distance, you know, you're, you're overlaying two, two rays in space. And so there's some, some error estimate in there. And by tracking it as we drive, we can actually make the rover get closer to it than we could have specified from where we, where we took it. So it's a way of making sure you get the target that, that you want when you get, get up close to it. Okay, so I've given you a lot of background on what kinds of stuff we did in C++. Uh, I thought I should talk a bit about how did we, you know, how did we choose to use it? How do we get to the point that we made it safe for use in space? So I'll go into some of those details now. And as I said earlier, historically there was a lot of resistance to using C++ on a space mission. And some of those arguments I tried to summarize here. Uh, using exceptions, if you have exceptions in your code, there's a lot of uncertainty in what the control path is, and you don't know what exceptions are going to be raised. Um, you know, you, you can throw an exception, and then it has to be handled up on top, or you don't want to reboot the spacecraft just because you have a thrown exception that, that wasn't handled. So with all that uncertainty, people didn't want to use that feature of the language. Uh, templates, templates are great, but it's easy if you're not careful to cause code bloat. And as you saw, we had very limited resources. I think one version of the STL that I saw was over meg one megabyte, and you can see that's more than 10% of the whole image size. So we didn't have the luxury of just throwing extra libraries into the problem. Um, and I'm just laying out the concerns here. Uh, the IO stream, we, since we're operating so far away, we don't have a real-time connection. It, we don't really use the console output, um, certainly not as a primary means of getting data back from the spacecraft. So any I.O. stream, we just try, try not to, didn't want to use. 
Uh, people just didn't trust multiple inheritance. We just didn't have the experience with it in our environment. We hadn't had the need for it, and so it, there wasn't any, any uh, push for it. People were concerned about uh, early implementations. Operator overloading is just a syntax issue, but it's something that uh, could be confusing when you have so many developers. We had at one point, I think, over 40 developers on, on a project and you know, changes over time. So these were all the concerns that people raised when someone would propose using C++. They would say all these things are problems and this isn't specific to C++, but using dynamic allocation uh, can be problematic and often if, when you're coding in an object-oriented style, you, you rely on the dynamic allocation a lot. Um, so those were some of the reasons people had for not putting it on earlier missions. So how do we convince them to let us use it on the Mars Exploration Rover initially and others since then? What we did at the time was we chose to limit our use of C++ uh, quite a bit. We, we fell back to the what's called the embedded C++ um, set of constraints. So you're not allowed to use exceptions. We didn't use any templates. There's no STL. There's no, no use of templates there. We don't use IO stream and no multiple inheritance. <clears throat> we didn't use any operator overloading except for new and delete, which I'll get into in a minute. Um, and for dynamic allocation, the, the, the entire project had the mandate that you don't want to do dynamic allocation anywhere. It's an embedded system, right? So you don't want it to just fault out because it runs out of, out of memory. And so it turned out it was a little bit relaxed from that. You could use dynamic allocation at init time. So you could allocate your buffers there and just keep them around, but you didn't want to be, be messing with it after that. Um, so the other thing we did, and so I actually did restructure the, the code for that uh, safe driving code to, to meet that. Um, but the other thing I did was came up with a, another um, memory pool, memory allocator that would make sure that we would never run out of system RAM by avoiding using, using the system heap completely. And I don't know if you, all of you are familiar with the, a way of using the new and delete uh, operators. You can use them with a placement syntax, and it's called placement new because you're, you're sort of telling it where to place objects in RAM. You're telling it I want you to allocate this much stuff and put it here in RAM. And so what we did was um, we used that capability together with overriding new and delete as a way of guaranteeing that even if we had C++ code that does use dynamic allocation, it's never going to touch the system heap. You know, the operating system provides functions that implement new and delete, but we're not going to use them. Instead, we're going to replace it with our own allocator so we can guarantee that even in the worst case, suppose we miss something and the, the autonomous driving stuff runs out of RAM or something. It's not going to affect the rest of the spacecraft at all because it's not even sharing the same, same code space. So that was actually a key point in how we were able to convince the project that this would be a safe addition and wouldn't compromise anything on the, on the spacecraft. And so we, we wrote our own, rolled our own memory allocator, uh, and it has a well-defined behavior in the case of if it were to run out of RAM. You could choose to either gracefully you know, issue a warning and return null, or you could choose to reboot. And it, it, the reason it's safe is that, obviously, no one prefers to reboot, but we're, we're safely on the surface of Mars. And when, when we're evaluating images, we're always doing it from a standing still position. So it's always going to be safe for us to do that. And it, it, it was, in fact, part of the design principles for the flight software. If anything in the flight software gets out of bounds from what you expect, it's safer to reboot and start again in a fresh configuration than, than potentially have any um, corruption in, in your RAM. Um, so anyway, the memory manager supported either use of that. And we could also feed it multiple different pools. In, and that was helpful because when we did some of that higher resolution processing for the arm placement, we actually gave it extra buffers from the uh, image buffer module. Uh, that has like two megabytes for every image, and so we we're able to throw some of those uh, chunks at it to give it more, more working room. And our memory allocator also provides diagnostics. If we turn it on, we can track every allocation and delete to make sure we're not, we don't have any leaks. And it also maintains a free space map that we can actually downlink at any time. We can generate a map of what's the current use of the, the memory. Um, <clears throat> Another nice feature of having rolled our own version of this is that you get to use the same allocator both in the real-time operating system and in your development on a separate system. So any testing that you do in your development environment, which is much faster to use than the, than the test beds, uh, is still relevant and still helpful to you. It still gives you insight into how the final system is going to work. 
And we didn't have any garbage collector. We didn't want to take the risk of, of you know, timing out in the middle of, of some operation. Um, so basically, we came up with this, and we end up using it. Every time we do autonomous operations on Mars, part of our standard operating procedure is we not only downlink the data that explains how it made its choices for which way to drive and how the images looked, we also downlink a dump of the memory map. And so if we should ever find ourselves with a leak, we'll at least have some traceability going back to be able to find where, where that came from. Um, so that, that was, these are all steps that we had to take in order to convince the project that we'd be safe to integrate C++ into our, into our onboard system. Um, <clears throat> so during, during the development, um, when, when we're actually in there writing the code, we had different, different stages uh, of, of testing. Um, so when you write code you, and you check it in into the repository, you have to also provide unit tests. And we use the unit tests to not only check individual pieces of functionality, but also do code coverage um, analysis, static analysis of the whole code base. So running the unit test, we, well, we do, we do the static analysis separately, and then running the unit test gives us the information about which features have we exercised. So we know that we have at least a test that, that takes us through a, a path in the, in the control flow. Um, and we have a whole suite of static analysis tests. We're running Coverity. We're running some other JPL locally developed tools for, for doing analysis. And happily, all these things do support C++. Um, so there wasn't, a, there wasn't a, a big issue integrating that. So that wasn't a... a, a impediment to getting C++ integrated. If you're interested in more of the static analysis work, then you can refer to this publication that goes into more, more detail what we did there. And then, as I said earlier, we want to um, do a lot of testing, test, test, test. Uh, we had a whole separate team for all the different p parts of the spacecraft for doing um, what we call VNV, validation verification. And these are other team members that we work closely with. As a developer, I get to work closely with the VNV team. but um, they're actually taking physical models of the rover or, or just the, the component boards and running it through its paces and, and making sure everything's working right. Uh, so this is all part of the standard program, and this is how we prove that both C and C++ parts of the flight software would be, would be good for the, for the mission. Uh, I won't bother getting into that, but let me just show some more pictures here. Um, this is the engineering model that we had of the Mars Exploration Rover, Spirit and Opportunity. So you can see it here um, out in the field. We got to do a field test where we tested the whole uplink. We actually were talking to it like through a, I believe through a satellite connection just to have the operators at JPL and the rover, you know, over 100 miles away. Um, so we had this, and I, you also saw the video earlier of testing this model inside in the in indoor sandbox. Uh, this is the highest fidelity test that we have. It has all the real sensors. You've got actual sensors, duplicates of the hardware on the real ones for, the, for all the cameras. The mobility system is identical. Inside the avionics are, are identical. Uh, mostly what, what's not identical in these engineering models are just power source. And occasionally we have different network access. But uh, even that, sometimes they, they take away the ethernet and make us use something more uh, akin to how it actually communicates in space. So here's just another overhead view. This was actually the very first time the Mars rover, uh, Mars Exploration rover, was driven autonomously at JPL. And we had developed a whole tracking system set up. We put cameras um, over our test bed, a dozen cameras looking down. We calibrated them, calibrated them for, to get the geometry. And the cameras would look for this dot pattern, this, sorry, this uh, three dot pattern here. And just based on measuring where those dots were and, and fitting a plane to that, it would figure out the position and attitude of the vehicle so we could get ground truth all the time of where a vehicle was. Uh, and these are just some images from one of those cameras showing how, how it, we aimed it sort of at the, past this rock pile. We said we want to go safely here, but watch where it's going. And you can see that it starts off facing the rocks, and then it veers away to the side and, and clears it as it gets past the rocks. So I don't think I need to go into all the gory details, but basically for both MSL and MER, we had several layers of testing. You know, you'd have your 
uh, layer where you have your own version of just your code with your own framework, your own test framework, your own test harness. Uh, and then there's various stages of being integrated with the flight software. So there's a stage with no integration with the rest of the flight software. There's a stage that's integrated just with nearby components uh, that can process commands. And then there's you know, different versions that have either 3D terrain simulators behind it or not. For all of this work, you know, I'm processing images trying to infer what the shape of the world is. So the only way to know if it's working is start with a known world. So we have a 3D, 3D renderer behind it um, to let us uh, do testing and, and ground truthing for it. And we had other stages that would be all the flight software, but without any 3D terrain. Uh, so then you have to, that, that takes longer, that's a harder process. A lot of the validation verification done with the real vehicle just takes a long time because you can't set up the model, you have to actually put it through its paces. So here's a picture of the uh, MSL engineering model. And it, it looks a little askew because it's actually on a slope uh, out in our test bed here. The, the world isn't tilted, the rover's tilted. Um, and here you can see some of it in motion. This is, actually, this is actually the top speed of the Mars rovers. It's about two inches per second. Um, not much more than about 100 meters an hour. And they were built that way because we want to always have the option of getting unstuck if we're stuck. So there's a lot of torque available in every wheel. I think it's the case that one wheel could pull half the vehicle. Um, and so to, to they just have a constant torque, there's no clutch. <coughs> um, so they only go that fast, um, and that's to keep it um, safe and able to get out of, of hazardous situations. And what you see here is a, uh, we put a separate camera on the vehicle as it was driving autonomously. So you're just getting a little bit of a view of what it looks like from the rover to drive through a test course. Uh, it, it takes longer at each step. It's processing um, each step for over a minute. So this is just a time lapse view. I'll just show it one more time. And this is a look at a real autonomous drive in JPL's Mars Yard. We don't need to do this kind of testing every day, but we still come out here as we're writing new new software. Okay, so that's that's kind of an overview of the different parts parts of the Mars Rover, what, what's gone into it, and just to give you some idea of how much we're using it, um, I I want to show you a plot. So. I'll show this briefly, then I'll go, go to the next one. This is showing you how far Curiosity has driven every day on Mars so far. And I made this on Monday, so it's pretty up to date. Um, you can see our, our best days so far, we've gone over 140 meters. And we command it in different drive modes, and this is a color coding of all the different modes. Let me, let me show you the same data, but as a cumulative plot, okay? So from here you can see that our peak in one day was about 140 meters, but on average we're doing uh, you know, closer to 60 to 80 meters a day on good days. But here, here's the same information, but shown in a cumulative plot. So I really like this. I'm a mobility geek. So um, what this is showing is that the red is what we call the directed drive, where we're not using the autonomy to, you know, choose where to go. We're just telling it go this way. Um, so we used a lot of directed driving when we first landed because we were just taking short steps. We we're just checking things out, making sure everything's working. And then this blue is with the visual odometry to measure how, how far it's going, how much it's slipping. And so I, really, I, I love this because this is just telling the whole story of, of the mobility history. So after we, we started moving more, we decided that in order to get farther distances, we wanted to rely on precise measurements. If you have to drive like 20 meters and turn right, you don't want to turn too quickly because the reason you're turning is to avoid something. So that whole initial part of your drive has to be done measuring your position along the way to make sure you're accurately where you intended to be. So you can see that as the mission progressed, we started using more and more autonomy. Uh, and you can also see that these long stretches here of like no increased odometry, uh, this is when we were doing drilling operations. So our first drill on the surface of Mars or the surface of any planet, any non-Earth planetary body by a rover. Uh, so that took a while. 
And then what happened was right here on Sol 200, we had the, the problem with the, the flash that caused us to boot back to the other, the other backup computer. That took us a while to resolve. And then Mars went behind the sun relative to Earth. So for a month, we couldn't even do much. We couldn't even talk to it. So all this time that we're not moving, there's reasons for all of it. But you can, you can call it out in the, the history of the driving here. But once we came out of there, we upgraded the software about almost a year into it, got the next version of flight software. And you can see here, this green is where we turned on the mode where it'll drive quickly as far as it can. Um, but if it has to, it'll, it'll automatically choose to turn on its, its slip measurement, its visual odometry. Uh, and so you're, you're, drive, you're getting fast drives because you're not stopping to look all the time, but at least you're checking. And if you need to, you'll kick in the visual odometry. And that actually saved us. Back on Sol 672, right about here, we were driving with, in this mode, and we started getting embedded. And the rover noticed that the motor currents are going up. And so it actually stopped itself driving to take pictures and measure how much it was slipping. And it measured almost, I think, uh, it was over 60% slip, maybe 70% slip. And that, or sorry, no, it measured 79% slip. We had set the limit to 60. And so that stopped the drive. So the rover was keeping itself safe, and it was smart enough to know that it should stop and take a look. So thanks to code written in C++. Um, and so these other, these other colors here are, the purple is when it's driving with the uh, hazard avoidance, where it's, we're telling it to look for rocks and steer around them. Um, so you can see that we're, we're doing all this stuff. And what I love about this plot, for me, being on, on Curiosity now, is that the comparable plot for MER would show that there's a lot more blind driving. Much more than half of the driving on MER was done in this blind mode. They'd only use the visual odometry occasionally to do a slip check once in a while. Um, so I really like that we've turned it around. And now, basically, you know, 90, almost 90% 90 of the driving has been done with some kind of autonomy, if not on, at least enabled, able to be kicked in. Um, and you can see our total progress here. We've hit 9,000 meters, so we've hit over nine kilometers so far. We're coming up to the 10K mark pretty soon. So I've, I've talked mostly about uh, how we're using C++ on board the Mars rovers, because that's, the, uh, that, that's been the focus of the talk, is getting it out into space. Uh, but it clearly is pervasive on Earth. You know, a lot of our ground tools that we use for, for doing our daily driving activities, you know, we're, we're looking at stereo pictures, we're processing the stereo data, we're displaying it and rendering it in 3D and zooming around to, uh, to plan the drives. And all that's using C++ libraries. Um, for doing the, um, the geometric manipulation of the, of the cameras and, and the data that it generates, the meshes that are being generated. <clears throat> and also, um, every time we get new drive data, um, the, there's background tools that, that look at the data and discover what's there and automatically process it and give us some kind of um, assessment of, of what's going on. And what's great is that Actually, every time either rover drives, either the Opportunity rover or uh, Curiosity, uh, sorry, one second. So every time either rover is driving on the surface of Mars and we get data down on Earth, uh, word goes out. You know, people are watching to, to see what happens, but also we get an uh, automated response. And what you're seeing in the slide are pictures of the kind that get sent to everybody's, um, everybody's phone. So like whenever, whenever Curiosity or Opportunity drives, they get a map on my phone with, with I know you can't see this, but uh, you know, it's the same kind of thing you're seeing up on the slides there. Um, I just get, get a nice view of what, what's happening and it's real time. You know, as soon as the data comes down within like 20 minutes, we get an update that has pictures. And the kind of stuff it includes is an overhead view of the, the map. So here are the orange boxes are the places where the rover driver said, you know, don't go there. That's a keep out zone. So stay out of that. Um, and then you can see the rover icon here showing where it ended up. And along the way, it's labeling any features that were labeled by the drivers. So uh, over here, you can see some examples of just boxes drawn around rocks. Anytime as a driver, we're laying out a course for the rover to drive blind in this directed mode, um, we, we measure all the rocks. And we say, how bad of a hazard is this? 
you know, do we want to go over that or not? And so we label it, and we'll get the annotations down not only in the drive plan, but also in the images that come down after the fact. So that's, that's how we can pretty quickly assess what happened the last time we drove and get ready for the next day's drive. Because you, know, you get new data down, and you know where you ended up, but were you safe to get there with any problems along the way? So at this point, we, we have a good, good process for assessing it. And it's kind of cool to get a, either a text message or an email showing you what happened on Mars. <clears throat> and so I've been talking entirely about the, the Mars missions, the Mars rover missions. Uh, but C++ is being used on other spacecraft. Now, I can't claim this is a complete overview. I didn't, I didn't talk to everybody at NASA and get a breakdown of every mission. But I did talk to several folks at JPL about things that they have worked on. And so I, I thought I'd just at least mention some of these other things. So if you're interested, you can, you can go take a look in more detail at some of these other, uh, other missions that are out there. So there's a Earth satellite called Earth Observing One. And that has been running some onboard autonomous control software, including a, a layer that's written in C++, uh, since 2005. So for pretty much the last decade, there's been a, a spacecraft orbiting Earth uh, where they send commands up that are, that are sort of like high-level science observations. And then on board, it, it figures out all the scheduling it needs with its own resources and pointing angles and, and scheduling of different activities of how to, you know, how to schedule those activities, how to collect the data, and, and transmit it. So that's running a C++, C++ is in the control loop there. It's actually part of the, the science uh, planners. They, they just send up their goals and let the spacecraft figure out how to make it happen. Um, there's also another instrument, the ISS Rapid Scat. It's an ocean wind velocity measurement. It's an instrument on the, on the space station. So that's also been developed using C++ and the control software. Um, the Aquarius mission was measuring sea surface salinity. And it, I mentioned MER had 10 megabytes. I read on a paper that this one only had three megabytes of space for code. And so they also had a real-time operating system plus C++ software for operating the spacecraft. <clears throat> and there are future missions, too, that are planning to use it. One is called GRACE Follow-On, tracking water movement. Um, there's a, a GRACE mission that's running now. And this one is being developed for, for launch in a couple of years. Uh, so this one and also various CubeSat missions, the smaller, smaller scale things are using C++ in the control loop. So it, it's definitely getting out there. Um, there is still resistance in, in different quarters to incorporating something new. You know, if they, get, if they can get by with what they've had all the time, they'll, they'll get by. But you can see that you know, the people who are into it are, are trying to uh, explore new possibilities. And uh, the, I talked to one person who's actually Kagi of part of that EO-1, the Earth Observing 1 spacecraft. And for him, the main argument for C++ is that it's actually cheaper to use C++ because it's easier to validate. You know, type safety buys you things that you don't have in C. And um, there's other reasons to actually prefer C++ if, if you're you know, now with more modern tool chains. A lot of people's perceptions still date back to the 80s when, you know, it was implemented using just macros and preprocessors to C compilers. Um, so th there are definitely people out there who have experience getting it into space who really believe that it's, it's a, a, a valuable tool, can be a valuable tool for, for new developments. So other places that I'm sure we'll, we'll see some of this coming up are, um, you know, not only has it flown on the MER rovers and Curiosity, but NASA is developing a new rover called the 2020 rover. And that's still very early in development. It's planned to launch in the year 2020. Uh, but that's taking its starting point with the MSL software code base. So, you know, we're starting from a point they're inheriting all the C++ that's in there. Uh, I can't comment on any, you know, future plans for that because it hasn't, hasn't been um, decided yet. But at least that's the starting point. They're coming in with that, that as, a, as a starting point. Uh, so another thing, the, the EO-1 and the Aquarius missions that are flying right now, um, they're actually using more C++ constructs than, than the Mars rovers did. Uh, so mm -hmm. let me think about it. So <laughs> nobody, nobody's yet using exceptions, um, but, but they are using, um, they're using namespaces, they're using more operator overloading, they're using some other um, um, 
they're using in inheritance, but not, not multiple inheritance, because they don't want any runtime type instantiation. There's no R RTTI in any of these missions, because it has to be very you know, fixed at, at build time. But I, I found it interesting when talking to these guys, I learned that uh, they still are following the mantra of no dynamic allocation. So even though they're using C++ and using more features of it, uh, because of the, because it's an embedded system, because they, they don't want to run the risk of running out of RAM, they're not they're not using a dynamic allocation except at init time. The reason I could get away with it on Mars is because it's a spacecraft, but it's on the surface of a planet. You know, the worst thing that happens is it just stops where it is and waits for help from Earth. If you're you know if you're in orbit and you make a make a bad mistake, you could end the mission. So uh, presumably they they had a harder you know, um, higher bar to, to pass in order to get the use of dynamic allocation there. But I made it work by keeping it completely separate from the control part of the, the spacecraft. It's only the driving part, and the driving is in a different different mode. So other missions using it, the, the James Webb Telescope is also using C++, and they're using it in conjunction with the IBM Rational Framework, so like uh, UML-like specifications and interactions with the language. And some of these other missions in the future, like the GRACE follow-up, follow-on mission and others, are advocating not only for using C++, but making it more tightly integrated with model-based languages like, like UML, um, so that you can use the UML to either parse the code and extract models from it, or in some cases go the other way. Use the UML model to do, be a code generator and provide at least templates, frameworks for, for the code that you're writing underneath. And so there is advocation uh, for, for that that's happening, but uh, I, I haven't seen that uh, been deployed yet, but there are people working on current projects who are thinking about it. And uh, this was a nice reference if you're interested in the, uh, the Aquarius mission. This, this paper talks a bit about how, how they were able to get their stuff done. Um, so that, that's the end of the formal talk. I'm, I'm a little bit early here. I apologize. I do have more material I, I can go into, but what I, what I think maybe I should do is, is open it up to questions. And uh, you know, if there's specific questions, I can bring up other other parts of it. You know, I have some other videos of the arm uh, at work, and I have other stuff about um, operating you know operating the, the spacecraft. But uh, if you do have questions, feel free to either ask directly, or they do have microphones set up um, in the in the aisles here. It'd be Easiest for everyone else if you wanted to line up at the mic, but I can try to repeat a question if, if you'd rather. Yeah. Is your memory allocator code available? Uh, well, an early version of it is, yeah. I, uh, um, I'll have, is my memory allocator code available? And what we did is uh, the software came from a research version of, of the code, right? We developed it a, w a while back. And so that is already available. Um, if you look on the NASA technology website for the Gestalt, G-E-S-T-A-L-T, -E that's the name of the, the software package. So you can find it in there. Thank you. Yes. Um, is C++ uh, your dream tool for this job, or could you think of something better? Is there something you're missing? Is there something I'm missing other than C++? Uh, I'm pretty happy with the C++. Um, the kinds of things that I'm missing and would like more of are more tighter integration with uh, like a 3D simulator, uh, make it more readily available, because it, it's still hard to get all the testing done in, in an easy way that's fully integrated with the rest of the flight software. We're making strides there. I, I, I did mention on one slide um, that we do have a simulator that kind of lets us do that, but it's still it's still not completely uh, close the loop there. But, but in terms of a language support, you know, the fact that we're on an embedded system, C++ is a good framework. I, I, I love the abstraction. I love being able to hide things. I love being able to just you know, write a new uh, filter, image filter just by you know, calling up a, a, a single function or a single, single use to run on any, any size image, any pixel type. That, that, that's, all, that's all very good. So. Yes? Uh, you've mentioned Velgrind and Purify. Uh, what kinds of bugs do they find for you, given that you don't allocate memory using malloc? And does your memory management tool cooperate with Velgrind and Purify? Wow, great questions. <laughs> um, so I mentioned I had written on one of the slides that we use tools like Velgrind and Purify for memory checking. And so what question is, what kind of bugs does it find, given that we don't do much dynamic allocation? Um, and it is true that we don't do a lot 
in part of the code, but, but some of the newer autonomy code, like the visual odometry and the MER version of the visual target tracking and some other, some other code that people test, uh, they still do use it. And so the, basically, the short answer is uh, we can turn off the memory allocator and have it sort of fall through to malloc on Unix. And so we can use those, those tools more easily that way in, the, in that mode. Um, but uh, was I able to integrate the memory manager with Valgrind? I, there's supposed to be a way to do it. I couldn't make it happen. And I had to move on to other things. Yes? Uh, I found individual developers are often really good at making their own module bug free. But when we get reports back from QA, uh, often it's at module boundaries. Uh, you guys had 100 modules. Did you guys do anything special to have that many modules and still be a success? Right, so how did we deal with uh, getting interactions between modules bug free, not just the individual modules? And that's really, that's really the, uh, the foundation of the whole test program, the validation verification. You know, we have teams of dozens or maybe even a couple hundred people who are separate from the developers who are going in and running system level tests um, all the time during development. And so they're the ones that take the modules and run it in a very realistic setting and um, try to you know, eke out any of the, those kinds of problems. Uh, in my own case, even though I, I, have, uh, I wrote the code for surface navigation, um, and I, I do have individual unit tests, I also have tests that, that talk to the other modules, because I thought it would be kind of crazy to um, you know, emulate the behavior of another module when I had the module sitting right there. Um, so basically, the, the answer is we have to do testing at all different layers. And in the slide I mentioned, we had like five or six different, different layers. So that, that's how we do it. We actually spend a lot of time not writing new stuff. We're not writing new stuff up to the end. We're spending time testing right up to, right up to launch and post-launch and, and even post-landing. Yeah. Um, can you talk a little bit more about uh, the rebooting? I mean, are you actually, like when you have to reboot the rover, are you actually rebooting the full system? Is that just a partial reboot? How does that, how do you do that in a safe way? Okay, so how to talk about how do we reboot the rover in a safe way. Um, I guess I didn't explain that part of it, but uh, Mars rovers reboot many times a day, several times, a, well, several times a day, on purpose, um, usually. And the way we manage that is, um, you know, there's just a standard set of wake up and shut down behaviors. And because we're on the surface, we, we can get away with this. You know, we, don't, we just don't need to stay awake all the time. We have parts of the system that stay up, always listening for, for you know, communication. But, but the, the main compute elements and all the sensors, they do get powered down often every day. So that, that's just the standard part of the operating process. Now, the, the kind of reboot that I talked about was an off nominal case, right, where the software identifies you have an assert, something that goes out of bounds, what do you do? Well, the, the safer response is to say, I don't know, if, if I have a failed assert, then something is wrong internally in the RAM, and I don't know why. So the safest thing to do is to stop and just reboot. So we, we log the history, we log the you know, available state, and then we, we start over. And so then, then what happens is any plans we had for the day get shoved aside. You're no longer running that control sequence that was set up for that day's activity. Instead, it gets into this fault you know, recovery mode where it's waiting for new commands back from Earth. First of all, a comment. Uh, no matter what language you use, it's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, secondly, I want to f uh, know about um, Mars rovers are meant to do some other function than just driving around. Uh, what is the means of collecting the scientific data and uh, how are they uh, transmitted back? And just a brief comment on that, if you would. Thanks. Right, so what are the other means of collecting scientific data on the Mars rover um, other than driving? So yeah, we drive to go to something, um, and what do we do once, once we're there? Well, we, we actually have several things. Um, I'm, what I'm showing now is an animation of the arm at work. So once we get to a location, we'll get a, a stereo view of the terrain. And I didn't go into the arm just because it didn't have C++, but it's also pretty awesome. Um, we have several tools on there. We have a spectrometer, we have an imager, we have a brush to brush away the surface of any, any dust on a rock. Um, and so what, what generally happens is instruments like this, these, these spectrometers here um, require direct contact with the target. So those instruments are on the arm and, and they, they take all this extra operation um, in order to make it happen. And, and humans are very involved in the loop here of selecting the right target 
the science team selects a target, then human rover planners will figure out how to, how to aim the arm to get there. <coughs> Um, but we also have different sensors on the rover. Some of the other science instruments can, can sense from far away. So we have an instrument that is a laser mounted on the shoulder. It literally burns up some of the terrain and then looks at it through a spectrometer remotely and measures the composition that way. So you know, how, do we, how do we do science on the Mars rovers? Well, some of it is up close and personal with the arm and some of it is remote, like with the uh, the chem cam for that remote sensing. And obviously some of it is just looking, you know, atmospheric studies or uh, astronomy or looking through the color cameras at the farther terrain. I just wanted to ask if you have any particularly interesting bug experience or implementation detail that you'd like to share with us. Any interesting bugs? Um, there's always interesting bugs. Um, sure, let me look here. I, I'm a little biased. This isn't may not may not quite be what you were after, but uh, I mentioned that we have an accelerometer and a, and a gyroscopes on board. So our inertial measurement unit, the IMU, is what we use all the time to estimate our attitude. And historically, like during development, the the visual odometry software, which takes pictures and provides the same information of like how your attitude changed. Um, historically, we've always preferred the IMU to the visual odometry because. The IMU is just this, you know, d delivered sensor. It's so robust. It's so good. It, it, it's got good, good results. Um, so whenever there's disagreement between them of more than like a degree or whatever the parameter is set to, we'll, we'll say, oops, visual odometry messed up. Uh, it's really this. And so on, on Curiosity in Sol 122 last, I guess, two years ago, um, we got such a, such a warning. It said, oops, visual odometry doesn't agree with the... Um, you know, with the IMU. And so I looked into it and I'm like, you know, what did I screw up? What's wrong here? And it turned out that the visual odometry was right. Uh, someone had misconfigured the other IMU processing software to ignore gyro changes when there's a big acceleration. So when the rover's driving and it drops off a rock, that's a big acceleration. And so they basically ignored the attitude update that happened during that fall. And so it got more than a degree out of whack. And in this case, the, the autonomy, the C++ code processing the, the images was able to discover the problem. And I mean, it wasn't smart enough to know that it was right and the IMU was wrong, but at least it led to us discovering this misset parameter. So happily, we, we fixed that parameter and everything's been fine ever since. Thank so that, 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 that's a bug that we helped fix, so. Yeah. So, awesome topic. I wish I had a job, but. <laughs> I wanted to know why, why did you choose visual odometry rather than some other part of the electromagnetic spectrum? And to how many lines of code? Um, how many lines of code? I, I apologize. I meant to check that and I just neglected to get the, the number for you. I, I just don't have it off the top of my head. I'm sorry. Um, so, but for visual odometry, why did we choose that as opposed to some other you know, part of the electromagnetic spectrum? Um, partly it's just what's available. We already have cameras on board. And um, <clears throat> for other terrestrial robot systems, other research systems, we'd already developed capabilities for doing visual odometry. Um, you know, you're already taking the pictures anyway to see what's out there. Why not use it for that too, basically? Um, so that, that was really the motivation. It was, we, anytime you try to put something new on a spacecraft, you, you get shot down unless it's really strictly necessary. So by piggybacking on the existing sensing, the existing processing, we're able to get it in there. Yeah. Hi. Um, given that you're in such a highly constrained resource environment um, computationally and uh, plus also having such a high requirement for um, kind of code safety, um, what sort of, I guess, what sort of decisions had to be made in regards to the compiler in terms of like what types of optimizations you can allow, what you can't, um, you know, and what all blow the code, what might not, and what will shrink it, what might not, those sorts of things, and you know, what, oh, that's maybe not safe because it doesn't quite work right on the Rad Harden processor, and um, so, you know, and how do you call the compiler to deal with these things? Yeah, that is a great question. How did we evaluate the compilers to determine that they'd be, you know, safe and reasonable for this, uh, this application? Um, that really was a team effort. You know, a lot of people were involved in making the selection, you know, both of the real-time operating system, the version, and the support behind it, 
Uh, as I said, throughout the 90s, we had a lot of researchers using the same OS <clears throat> and their compilers to, uh, you know, to do initial development. But uh, you know, for each mission, it was just a case of the flight software team at the time looking at the available possibilities and choosing what they wanted. Uh, we had used the commercial multi-compiler for MER because uh, at the time they wanted the you know, commercial support for any problems that came up. Um, for MSL, at, at that time, my understanding is, I wasn't directly involved, but my understanding was that at the time that we were choosing everything, uh, Multi wasn't yet working with the version of VxWorks we were looking at. And whereas, you know, we were able to do okay with the GCC. So people, uh, people who know more than I do about the, about the issues looked into it and made, made that call. Uh, but basically, over time, we're, we're constantly evaluating and assessing what's going on. And if we discover that there's a lot of code bloat, we'll track down the reason. Um, you know, we have a whole system of bug reporting where any bug is kept in, and, and it's not just on you, it's on the whole team to, to discover it and track it down. So I, I guess the, um, I, I can't give you the direct technical answer, but it's basically having a lot of people looking at the problem. So what, uh, I guess on that, in that context, what sort of optimizations are allowed to be taken by the compiler? You know, can you turn on loop unrolling or can you not? You know, uh, things like that. Oh, well, yeah, um, we did, does that actually we, we did make optimizations like the, the Stereovision processing uh, is doing this matrix, you know, uh, munging. And, and so we, we, we basically tune things as appropriate for every, every problem. And the way that we validate it is by this whole VNV program where we have so many people checking and rechecking and trying again. And, and, and you know, we're, we're running the rover through drives out of the Mars yard with the cameras on all the time. So anytime we make a change, if there's an issue, we, we hope to discover it that way. Um, but, but that, that's really the, the main way. Basically, when we make the call early on in development, we try not to change it after that. So we don't make changes to the optimizations and stuff late in the game, because we want to discover any problems early. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. What does the subset of C++ look like that you're allowed to use on Earth? I assume with 64-bit supercomputers, you get dynamic allocations and stuff? Oh, yeah. Yeah, so what C++ can we use on Earth? Well, I didn't get into that. I mean, there's really no constraints there. As long as everything's working and tested and you can show it, then uh, you're not worried about running out of resources. So we don't... Sorry? How about exceptions? Even exceptions. Uh, actually, an early version of the visual odometry code that I saw had exceptions in it. I had to take them out. Um, so, yeah, I mean, people, people are using more C++ on, on Earth. It's just when it has to get approved for space flight, there's more constraints that go into it. For future missions, would you consider using templates to uh, provide better compile time checking of constraints and that sort of thing, like boost units or that sort of thing? I know you probably use metric now that after the orbiter thing. Right. So would we consider using templates? I mean, I would, for sure. Um, convincing other people is the hard part. Uh, other projects at JPL have, have, have used templates, but in a limited way where you have to like get approval for it and only instantiate it for one type or something like that. Um, so yeah, there's nothing, as far as I'm concerned, technically there's nothing that necessarily precludes using templates. Um, it's just a, a general, other people have this general concern that if, if you don't keep track of it, it's just another potential problem. You don't, you don't want to add potential problems to your development. That, that's been why it hasn't been used so far. But I think if we could guarantee you know, behavior or performance, that, that would be certainly open to that. And my, my other question is, how do we get a hold of that uh, news feed app that sends the <laughs> pictures to our phones? Uh, I have been in talks with the outreach folks, but it hasn't come up yet. I apologize. It, so far, you have, to, you have to be working at JPL right now to get it. Sorry. But actually, I, all the images are on the website at about the same time. Uh, like a couple hours after it comes down, you can go to mars.jpl.nasa.gov. You can see images, the same as I said, just won't have the annotations in it. Yeah. So your navigation does plan, run, stop, plan, run, stop. Uh, why the stopping? Right, so why do we stop when we're driving? Um, part of the reason is that our motor controllers can only either drive or steer, but not both. That's just a hardware design that they came up with. Um, so if we need to steer, we have to come to a stop. Uh, and since we're sort of doing, we don't, we don't do that every step, but we do it often enough that we didn't consider it that much more of a burden to do all the thinking there. Uh, also, grabbing the images, we have a very long exposure time. There's a thick neutral density filter that was added that dims the light in order to improve the CCD response. And so it takes like half a second to take a picture. So we didn't want any motion blur. 
Um, so that, that's why we stop. Uh, I have two questions. Um, I'm curious how many of the unexpected reboots you've had, uh, you know, due to, due to an assert or whatever, or how often that happens. And then the uh, second question is, you mentioned you had uh, leak detection. Um, you know, you'd go back and look at the map and see if you've proved whether you had or did not have leaks. And I was curious if, if that has happened and if you've made bug fixes due to that since the rovers uh, shipped. Um, so how, how often have we rebooted uh, inadvertently? I, I don't have the number in my head. Um, depending how you count back on early in the Spirits mission, SOL-18, uh, before Opportunity even landed, we had an event where there was a problem with the flash memory. And what ended up happening is it would boot up, get almost done booting, but then it would fail to load the file system and then reboot. Because of that one bug, it rebooted like hundreds of times. Um, and it took us a few days to figure it out. I was actually amazed in just a couple days people figured out based on no data what was going on. Um, but except for that event, which is sort of unique, um, it certainly I think it's been less than two dozen times. Um, um, but actually, Opportunity recently had some trouble. And if you read the news for the last week, we just reformatted the flash on Opportunity because it kept having failures to remember things and that it ended up causing some reboots too. Do you think that was due to um, uh, gamma events or something in the memory? you think the memory was corrupted? Well, just the flash, it's been 10 years on Mars. And so it's got some errors. And they just reformatted it. And it's been working, working pretty well since then. But you know, I'm sorry I'm told the, the session is over. So thank you all for coming. I'm glad to be here. Mm -hmm.